สวัสดีค่ะ Cameron Sinclair co-founder of a charity organization called Architecture for Humanity calls himself a CEO chief eternal optimist Cameron aims to find architectural solution to humanitarian crisis as well as to help communities in need worldwide Take a look at how this organization work, and you'll think again how architecture can actually change the world. I never went to a famous building. I never went to a cathedral. I never got to go and saw big, magnificent architecture. I became an architect because of bad architecture. Cameron, you co-founded Architecture for Humanity. What is it? Uh, it's an organization that gets architects, designers, and builders involved in humanitarian work around the world. We provide design and construction services to communities either uh, post-disaster or in areas of uh, of poverty um, or post-conflict. Can you please give us some examples of your interesting projects? Oh, um, well, at the moment, we're currently working in 22 countries. Um, we're doing post-disaster reconstruction work in northern Japan um, after the tsunami there. Mm -hmm. um, we are rebuilding um, dozens of schools and hundreds of houses in Haiti after the earthquake. Um, and then we're working on a series of youth projects throughout Africa and throughout South America um, to tackle social issues. So we're using sports as a mechanism to uh, tackle everything from um, conflict resolution to um, uh, HIV AIDS to alleviate poverty. So, How do you do it? Let's, let's take the case of um, okay. HIV AIDS. Okay. In um, Kailisha, which is a slum just outside of Cape Town, there's a very high instance of HIV AIDS, especially amongst young people. Okay. Um, there is um, very few doctors and very few medical professionals that can teach and to give information about this. It's also a very scary topic. Hmm. It's also, for, for kids, it's, it's not something you sit people down in a room and you lecture them about, you know, you know kids, you can't lecture kids. Hmm. So you have to do it in a fun environment. Hmm. So we're partnered with a group called Grassroots Soccer to build five-a-side soccer field. Boys and girls play soccer. And there's a clubhouse that has after-school programs, health, education, and the people that run the facility are trained medical professionals. And they do things like education and testing. And we opened the facility um, just after the World Cup, and 20,000 children have gone through the training program. So you built the facility? We build the facility. So we build the hardware, and then we have a partner that does the software. You know, so you like a computer, you know, we, we build the computer and somebody else builds the programs. And so we partner with local NGOs. Hmm. How did you come up with the idea in the first place to marry architecture with um, humanity or social issues? Well, um, I wasn't always this polite and I also, um, I grew up in a very tough neighborhood, South London. Uh, and I was kind of like, I was a little bit like Oliver, you know, the, like I was a bit of a street kid. And I lived in uh, a neighborhood that was very, very tough, very violent, and very poorly built. And I became an architect because I wanted to change those environments. I never went to a famous building. I never went to a cathedral. I never got to go and saw big, magnificent architecture. I became an architect because of bad architecture. And so when I trained, my focus was how do we improve neighborhoods that are poorly built and make them into uh, peaceful and more holistic places where where communities can grow together. So, mm. I trained to do this. So you went to architecture school, mm -hmm. and this is your goal. Yeah, this and I was I was do. I was totally the black sheep of the entire school. Nobody every time like my professor would ask me to build an opera house, right? right? And so instead of building an opera house, I would take all the uh, air conditioning exhaust, which you get all the hot air and I would build a homeless shelter that would heat all the homeless shelter, right? And they would get so mad at me. And I said, but you've got to help the people that are living on the streets too. Hmm. So, you know, I constantly um, uh, would find ways to help those in need. Wow, why not work in an NGO in the first place? Um, I couldn't find an NGO. 
that actually looked at the qualities of architecture. I mean, I, when I was 22, um, I saw what was happening in Kosovo. I happened to be working as an architect in nearby. I was restoring Brancusi uh, monuments in Romania at the time as a professional designer. And um, I realized that there was a huge need for housing returning refugees. And I couldn't find an architectural NGO that was doing that. Uh -huh. So I just called the United Nations and I said that I'll do it. Oh. So if nobody else was willing to step up, I stood up. I stood up. How is your design or the way you design mm -hmm. all these facilities, whether it's school, buildings, mm -hmm. or just any facilities that you need mm -hmm. different from how other architects would design it for the same purpose? Well, one thing is the budget is different. So we just mm -hmm. recently did medical clinics in India, and my client came up to me and, and he said, the number one criteria is that it's $3 a square foot. Wow. And for me, that's a challenge. I was like, okay, let's do this, okay. right? So our budgets are very constrained. Mm -hmm. Also, the buildings themselves have to be very sustainable. Not because you know, of climate change and the environment, but because if the, if the expenses on the building has to be low enough that the owner can pay for it. So it has to be off-grid, it has to be sustainable, it has to use solar, you know, and we're not doing it because we're trying to be you know, like a tree hugger. We're doing it because it's survival. <laughs> Right? Uh -huh. So the way we think is, is uh, in the mind of the owner of the building. And so the aesthetic responds to that. So quite often, our buildings are not super beautiful, they're not slick, but they're loved. Part of the criteria, this is the way we design, mm. is I tell my architects, is this the house that you would allow your grandmother to live in? My grandmother. It, because, because, you know, sometimes you don't get on with your parents, but you always get on with your grandparents, and you don't want to disappoint <laughs> skip them. Skip one generation. Yeah, skip eh? one generation. And, the, and if the architect can't honestly say, I would allow my grandmother to live in this house, then it's not good enough. So it's not decent enough. It's not decent enough, not dignified enough. So mm -hmm. even if you're, you're working with someone who's very poor, who's homeless, who's destitute, you have to design for them with dignity. So you always have to think about, this person is just unfortunate right now. And we could build a structure that would make them feel like they were something, somebody, and that they could achieve something. It's almost like a strong architecture is a signal of recovery. So it's our responsibility to design dignified and design well, because we're not just building a building, we're giving people the, the okay that it's time to recover.